Welcome back. You're watching to the point. Yesterday, External Affairs Minister Shushma Swaraj said the government will consult the Supreme Court over whether it can take the Saurabh Kalia case to the International Court of Justice. But does the court have a say in the matter? And secondly, does it really suit India to take this step? Those are questions that no one asked when the decision was first announced. Tonight, we directly confront them. My guests are India's former High Commissioner to Pakistan, Satya Bratpal, and the well-known Supreme Court lawyer, Sanjay Hegde. Mr. Hegde, the government has said that it will seek permission from the Supreme Court whether it can take the Saurabh Kalia case to the International Court of Justice or not. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Has the Supreme Court got a say in the matter or is the government simply raising a red herring? The Supreme Court's permission is not required at all. The case pending in the Supreme Court is asked the government to take the matter to the uh, international court. The government could very well have conceded it in the Supreme Court saying that yes, we are going to take it. Or even without the Supreme Court's order, the government could directly take a decision to go to the International Court of Justice. This kind of claim that you need permission from the Supreme Court is a red herring. So in other words, it is an irrelevant issue raised by the External Affairs Minister. It is not germane to the matter. Is that correct, Mr. Hegde? Absolutely. You do not need the Supreme Court's permission to go to the International Court of Justice. You can do it on your own back. Now, Mr. Pal, some newspaper reports have suggested that India and Pakistan, as members of the Commonwealth, cannot take their joint disputes to the International Court of Justice or to any other international tribunal. Is there such a bar on Commonwealth members? No, there is no such bar. But when India accepted the, the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, it made a declaration in 1974, which all countries are permitted to do. And there India said that among the issues where it would not accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ in contentious cases would be any case involving a country that was either a member of the Commonwealth or which had been a member of the Commonwealth. Pakistan then was not. If this is a very interesting point you're making. It's not a bar that's imposed by the Commonwealth on India. It's a bar that India voluntarily imposed on itself. Absolutely. At, at, and, 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 and with good with, with good cause and we've made good tactical use of it as well. I'll come to the good cause later but then what this means is that today when Pakistan is a Commonwealth member and India is a Commonwealth member if India stays true to a voluntary commitment it made it can't raise this issue with Pakistan at the ICG but if it does raise it then it will be going back on its own voluntary commitment. Uh, it, it is not a, so much a voluntary commitment as a qualification of the ICJ's jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis India. And if we were now to take this case to the ICJ, the ICJ would be well within its rights to say that in future you can't come back and keep on changing your position. Now, Mr. Hegde, let me bring you in again. We're now talking about a voluntary commitment or a voluntary bar that India imposed upon itself that it would not take to international tribunals contentious disputes concerning other Commonwealth countries and Pakistan is another Commonwealth country. In this specific instance, can the Supreme Court somehow clear the way by giving India permission to revoke its own voluntary commitment or is the Supreme Court once again unnecessary and irrelevant? The Supreme Court has no role in India's international relations. If India has put in a reservation with regard to the jurisdiction of the ICJ and it wants to change its mind, India can very well do so without any go-ahead or any permission from the Supreme Court. In the sovereign affairs of the country, in its diplomatic affairs, the Supreme Court has no role. So once again, as you said in response to my first question, once again you're saying this is a red herring. Asking the Supreme Court for permission is irrelevant. This is something the government can do on its own. It doesn't need to go to the Supreme Court to clear the way. Have I understood you correctly? Absolutely. They're only buying time because there is a matter pen, uh, relating to the Sarokalia uh, um, case in the Supreme Court, which is coming up in August. They're just kicking the can down the road. Now, Mr. Paul, beyond 
whatever voluntary bar India may have accepted with regard to other Commonwealth countries, there is another good reason why it would be inadvisable for India to raise the Saurabh Kalia matter at the ICJ. And that is to do with the fact that in 1999, roughly the same time as the Saurabh Kalia incident happened, there was the shooting down of the Pakistani plane, the Atlantique. And that issue in 1999 was taken by Pakistan to the ICJ. India at that time rejected the ICJ's jurisdiction in the matter. Explain to the audience what happened and why that case bears relevance to this issue today. Well, it's, it's absolutely critical because when Pakistan lodged its case at the ICJ, India objected to the ICJ assuming jurisdiction on two grounds. Firstly, it reminded the ICJ that when it had accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, it had specifically debarred anything to do with a country that was a member of the Commonwealth. Secondly, it drew attention to Pakistan's own declaration in which it had ruled out uh, any uh, dispute being brought to the ICJ that pertained to an international treaty unless all states parties to that treaty were made part of that process. The ICJ didn't even have to look at in their second objection. It looked at the first. It rejected Pakistan's contention this, that this was not relevant because it was not presently a member. Said that India was categorical, any country that had been or was, and therefore said that it had no jurisdiction. If we now were to go back to the ICJ with a case against Pakistan, the ICJ would immediately make two points. Firstly, that it had accepted in 1999 India's case that it had no jurisdiction vis-à-vis -a, -vis a Commonwealth country. And if India was now withdrawing that uh, with reservation, then clearly Pakistan would be within its rights to say, you did not consider our case on the Atlantic on merits, only on procedure. And now that India has withdrawn its reservation, consider that Atlantic case again. And secondly, Okay, can I just interrupt there before you come to second? And therefore, by taking the Saurabh Kalia case, we would give both the ICJ and Pakistan grounds to revive Atlantic. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And you were saying secondly? The second uh, problem we would face is that we ourselves had invoked Pakistan's reservation as a reason for the ICJ not taking cognizance. And if we were to take this case now, we would basically be saying, that Pakistani soldiers violated the Geneva Conventions, which are again a multilateral treaty. And therefore Pakistan would say, unless India makes all states parties to the Geneva Convention a party to this case, it won't accept jurisdiction. Is there a third consequence? That India would look contradictory, and therefore in the eyes of the international community, India would look, how shall I put it mildly, silly. Silly and self-serving, well, which, which, which of course is, is no bad thing, but self-serving in a rather stupid fashion. You've given me two or three very sound, valid, cogent reasons why A, India can't take up this matter and B, why India shouldn't take up this matter with the ICJ. Do you then get the feeling that by claiming yesterday that India is seeking the permission or the clearance of the Supreme Court to give it the right to take up the matter with the ICJ, all Mrs. Suraj has done is to raise the hopes of the Kalia family only to eventually dash them within days or weeks. That would be very cruel, but that, that I'm afraid is exactly what will happen. That is exactly what will happen. Absolutely. So because bluntly, there is no option. There is really no option. All these options were considered in 1999 and ruled out for the reasons that I've explained. And you also say to me that it's very, very unlikely that your colleagues at, in South Block would somehow find a way of convincing Mrs. Swaraj that she should do a volt fast and change India's policy on this issue. That, that I don't know. That I don't know. But I, I really can't see what has changed. International law hasn't changed. The same constraints apply. And therefore it follows that intelligent foreign service officers with a sense of history, with a sense of knowledge as you do of the past, will argue to Mrs. Swaraj, Mrs. Swaraj, we have to stick with the policy that has been our policy for the last 15 years. I hope they do. Mr. Hegde, I want to come back to you on that key point. Do you agree with Satya Pratpal that by 
yesterday saying she was seeking the Supreme Court's clearance or permission to take this matter to the ICJ. All Mrs. Swaraj has done is to raise the hopes of the Kalia family only to eventually dash them. Do you agree with that? I do think Mr. Paul is right. And in fact, the Supreme Court, if at all such permission is sought, will just turn around and tell the government that you don't need our permission. Where have we ever taken any sovereign decisions on the diplomatic front for you? It is entirely up to you whether to accede to the jurisdiction of the ICJ or not to accede. You are not approaching the Supreme Court in its advisory jurisdiction. If that, the the your... Supreme Court will just say, look, we have nothing to do with the matter. Take your decision. In fact, then, Mr. Hegde, you're saying something more as well. You're saying that in the eventuality that Mrs. Raj actually does seek the Supreme Court's permission and clearance, it's possible, by the way, she could change her mind, particularly after hearing you and Mr. Paul. But if she goes ahead with her original stand, the Supreme Court could actually rebuff the government with a very embarrassing reply, which is, you don't need our permission, don't come to us. This is not an area where you can seek our advice. You're being silly in trying to do so. This could be a damaging, embarrassing rebuff from the Supreme Court. Am I right? Absolutely. They may, not, they may not use all those words, but their intent would be very clear. They would just say, you don't need our permission. Mr. Paul, let's go one step further. It's quite clear that the ICJ would be ruled out for a variety of reasons that you've explained. Are there other international tribunals where the Kalia case can be raised? For instance, what about the International Criminal Court? Does it make sense? Is it feasible for India to raise this there, or is that equally inadvisable? Well, India can't, because India is not, not a member of the, well, it's not, not a state party to the statute of the, of the International Criminal Court, nor indeed is Pakistan. Uh, it is entirely possible under the statute of the ICC for a private citizen or a private individual to lodge a complaint. But that complaint in this particular case would be problematical for two reasons. Firstly, because Pakistan is not a state party. And secondly, this would mean a retroactive jurisdiction which the ICC normally does not have. The one way of getting around this would be to invoke that provision of the ICC statute which permits the Supreme Court, uh, sorry, sorry, the Security Council to make a reference to the ICC. To do that, however, India would have to go to the Security Council. And that is complete anathema as far as the government of India is concerned. Clearly, there is no way India could take a Kashmir-related issue to the Security Absolutely. Council because it would revive the Security Council's jurisdiction Absolutely. in the matter which we believe has lapsed with time. What about the special tribunals that were set up to handle Yugoslav war crimes? Could something like that be set up for this? Both the ad hoc tribunals on Yugoslavia and on Rwanda were set up by the Security Council acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which means a mandatory jurisdiction. That again means India going to the, uh, to the Security Council. So that's really not on. Well then, now this is a very interesting and rather poignant situation. It's inadvisable and wrong to go to the International Court of Justice. It is difficult, if not impossible, to go to the International Criminal Court. It's completely unbelievable that India would raise the matter at the United Nations Security Council to set up an ad hoc tribunal. So all three routes are clearly ruled out. In which case, how can India seek justice for Saurabh Kalia and the other five Javans who were brutally and barbarically killed? You know, the options are extremely limited. If you, if you want binding judicial decisions, these are the only avenues that we talked about. And they're all closed? They're all closed. If you look at uh, what might be considered sort of moral suasion, you can raise it as a human rights violation in any of the, uh, the mechanisms of the Human Rights Council. In Geneva? In Geneva. Those, unfortunately, also would not really give you particularly, uh, it wouldn't give you much joy. Th th there are two or three pr uh, processes that are available to India, uh, all of which have their own problems and none of which guarantee any satisfaction. So at the end of the road is the best option, one that perhaps is unlikely to yield results, bilateral pressure on Pakistan. Yes. Yes, yes. That, that's really the only option. And 
and, and that will be difficult because Pakistan has from the outset said that no such thing happened. Mr. Hegde, you've heard the conversation, you've heard the conclusions we've come to, you've heard in fact that the only real credible option, and it's not a likely option to yield results, is India exercising bilateral pressure on Pakistan. Let me therefore, in the context of the conclusion we've reached, quote to you what Nirmala Sitaraman, a BJP spokesman at the time, said in 2013 when the UPA made it clear that they would not raise the Kalia case at the International Court of Justice. This is what Mrs. Sitaraman said. The sovereign authority with which you may persuade a neighboring state about issues which are very critical to your national honor is being neglected. And then Mrs. Sitaraman added, this government, meaning the UPA, is definitely neglecting issues of India's state honor and India's people's honor. Today, would you accept that that criticism is entirely mistaken? Because her government is in exactly the same position as the UPA and she didn't understand the nature of that position when she made this criticism. I doubt Mrs. Sita Raman would repeat it today as a member of the government. It's very easy to say things when you are in the opposition. You, you provide a television soundbite or two. But when it comes to the actual business of government, that is when you have to take hard choices and sometimes there is no choice at all. If consistent with your national policy of keeping the things out of the United Nations, you decide not to invoke any of those jurisdictions and that has been your long-standing policy. It would be a very tough call to make an exception for one case only because there are no exceptions for single cases. This is a call which every government has to take and regretfully it may have to live with the choices that it makes. But you're saying something equally important which is the claim made by Mrs. Suraj and she used this word yesterday that this is an exceptional case actually doesn't cut ground because even on the grounds it's an exceptional case the vote fast that it would involve in India's policy the contradictions that it would involve in India's traditional stand would be too expensive for India to bear absolutely um, the exception will eat up the rule you have laid down a norm that you will not be getting into any a bilateral or commonwealth issue in international forums and that was advisedly because of uh, Kashmir and other uh, reasons. Now to give that norm up on the basis of one particular case would probably bind your successors to a lifetime of uh, submitting to jurisdiction in a variety of cases. In which case, my last question to you Mr. Park, is there any hope that we could get a friendly third country say the United States, to weigh in on Pakistan on our behalf to secure justice for Saurabh Kalia and the other five Jawans. Let's not forget there were five other Jawans equally brutally and horribly killed. Unfortunately, the world is such, their names are forgotten, but they're as much victims as he was. Well, there was also an, an Indian Air Force flight lieutenant. True. Um, sadly, if you involve a third party, the third party exacts his own price. Uh, and that price is not something between India and Pakistan that India has ever been prepared to pay. Uh, I think only yesterday, Ms. Mrs. or day before yesterday, Mrs. Swaraj again repeated when she was releasing her handbook uh, of the Ministry of External Affairs that between India and Pakistan there was no third party. Uh, I don't think approaching a third party in this case is going to help at all. When Kargil happened, there was a third party willy-nilly involved. The United States was very closely involved in trying to get that mess sorted out. But I don't think it would be at all advisable, uh, nor would it get us any joy or the family any relief or justice uh, to involve a third party at this stage. Which means then that the UPA did the best it could and the NDA is doing the best it can except for the fact that Mrs. Swaraj has slightly muddied the waters by offering false hope to the Kalia family which will be dashed and then she'll have the additional problem of a very disappointed Kalia family and presumably a media and a press which will feel angry because they will have believed that she actually had a route which in fact she never had at all. Absolutely and could I just remind you 
that it isn't just the UPA from 1999 to 2004. It was the NDA that Absolutely. examined all these issues. Mr. Jaswant Singh and Mr. Vajpayee. And, and ruled them out because they were not feasible. So in a nutshell, with her statement yesterday suggesting she'll seek the Supreme Court's permission to go to the ICJ, has Mrs. Swaraj made her already tricky, awkward problem considerably worse? Because she's now added in the emotional element of disappointing the victim's family. Yes, I and mean, she's raised hopes that she cannot possibly satisfy. So she's going to live to regret her statement of yesterday. Sadly, I think so. Mr. Bal, thank you very much for joining me. Mr. Hegde, thank you very much for joining me. And there we end this particular episode. And I'm afraid it ends on a rather disappointing note for the Kalia family. The hopes that Mrs. Swaraj raised, my guests at any rate, firmly believe will be dashed. And unfortunately, it also suggests that justice for Saurabh Kalia, and let's not forget the other five Jawans as well as the Air Force pilot, is unlikely to happen anytime soon, if it happens at all. On that rather sobering note, if you have been, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.